Welcome to Chapter 14, Exploitative Interactions. During this chapter, I'll be talking about the various ways that animals and plants actually use each other in order to get food or to get protection or to develop an innovative habitat. During this chapter, I'll be talking about the uh, very intricate interactions that organisms have with each other in order to exploit them in a variety of different ways. And we'll be looking at some mathematical models that help to predict what might happen in a predator-prey or a parasite-host relationship. And then finally, I'll be talking about the impact of refuge areas or different types of refuges that um, organisms use in order to avoid predation or parasitism. We can define exploitation as the impact that one organism has on another so that the first organism's numbers increase or its health increases and the other one is damaged. So it's pretty obvious when you consider predators, you know, the predator kills the prey and eats it and then therefore it has the energy in order to reproduce and so its numbers increase. And parasites, in a similar way, feed on their, their prey, but they generally don't kill the host. If a parasite were to kill its host, then it's also destroying its habitat, and it would then die. So it's, the, it's a real benefit for a parasite to maintain its host or allow its host to live in order that it continues to have a place where it can live and eat. The parasitoid is an interesting situation where the uh, parasite actually is deposited inside an individual as an egg and then grows up and kind of eats its way out of that. And then a pathogen is just a disease-causing organism that sometimes kills the host or it just may cause it to be sick for a while. So I'll start out with a description of an interesting interaction between an acanthocephalon and an amphipod. The acanthocephalons are fascinating little worms that have a spiny head that is actually inside the body of the acanthocephalon and then it shoots it out into the tissue of its uh, host and then it's attached there because the spines kind of point backwards. And in the case of the acanthocephalon and the amphipod, the acanthocephalon is attached to the amphipod until it reaches a certain stage in its life history where it's ready to transfer to its next host. And at that point, it causes a change in the behavior of the amphipod so that it swims toward light instead of away from light. And then it's uh, more likely that the predators of the amphipod will then eat it and the acanthocephalon will be transferred then to its primary host. In figure 14.2 of your book, you see the description of another exploitative interaction. It's very similar. Again, it's an acanthocephalon, a spiny-headed worm, but this time it infects a, a pill bug or an isopod. Um, some people call these roly-poly bugs because they roll up in a ball for protection. But these typically hide under leaves or uh, stay out of light colored areas because their body is somewhat dark and that way they avoid predation by birds like the starling that's depicted in the diagram. The, the acanthocephalon again changes the behavior of the isopod when it's ready to be transferred 
to its primary host, the starling, and it causes the acanthocephalon to move out into lighter colored areas, and then the starling can pick it off, and the acanthocephalon gets into its primary host. This exploitative behavior also happens in plants, and the example given in your book and comes from the Rocky Mountains, where a mustard plant is infected by a rust fungus, and here that rust fungus actually causes the meristematic, tis meristematic tissue of the plant, that's the area that's dividing and uh, causing uh, growth, it's the area of growth, it causes it to change and uh, become a structure that looks like a flowering plant. And then insects come along and they're attracted to that area because it produces a sugary substance, a bit like nectar, and uh, then the insects will carry the reproductive materials of the fungus uh, in, instead of the, the plant and it allows the fungus then to reproduce and carry on and that eventually kills the plant. Experiments done by Park and his colleagues on the flower beetles added even more complexity to this whole interaction that we have between parasites and their and their hosts. In this case the protozoan parasite actually changed the outcome of competition between these two beetles. And this just certainly points out for us that when we're evaluating competition between individual species that uh, there may be other things at play that we don't understand. The impact that animals have on their food supply was made particularly obvious in two studies that were done. One was in an attempt to get rid of the prickly pear cactus in Australia. They found that a herbivorous moth was able to reduce that population dramatically. In another case, Lamberti and Resch in a stream experiment demonstrated that Heliopsyche borealis caddisfly larvae was able to reduce their food supply, the algae, dramatically by doing a test with tiles where they raised the tiles off the stream bottom to show the difference between those tiles that had where the heliopsyche had access and those where it didn't. Another classic example of the impact of a organism on its food supply is the example of the snowshoe hare and the lynx. The fluctuations in snowshoe hare populations uh, were measured by extensive trapping done by Elton and Keith and they tried to figure out what was causing the ups and downs in the, the population and they had developed several different theories about all of this. But finally, when they evaluated the predator-prey relationship between the lynx and the, and the snowshoe hare, they saw that as the lynx uh, preyed on the snowshoe hare, then the population went down, and then the food population for the hare went up. And then once the lynx population went down because its food had been reduced, then you'd see an increase in the hair population and this would just go back and forth with the subsequent impact on each of their food supplies. Ladka Voltaire developed a formula which predicts the impact of uh, predators or parasites on prey and in this formula we have uh, dn over dt, which again is saying the change in a population over time, and this is describing the host population, and we multiply that times the, the intrinsic rate of increase for that population, r, so you have rn, n being the number of individuals in the host population, 
and then you subtract the number of uh, hosts times the number of predators times a predation rate, p. And that allows you to uh, estimate then what the impact of predation or a parasite is on the host population. So the model predicts what I was describing for the hair and the lynx relationship. We have a host that as it reproduces and increases in number has an increased impact on its prey. And then as the prey populations decrease, then that feeds back to the predator population and causes a reduction in the reproductive rate for the predators. And so their population then decreases. This relationship is described in figure 14.18 on page 324 in your book and it shows how the increase in predator population causes a subsequent decrease in prey population. And it, if you remove the time component from this it ends up in a circular pattern um, which is also described as a cyclic pattern. Laboratory experiments using predators and prey have demonstrated the same cyclic type of behavior, but most of these laboratory experiments have resulted in the extermination of one of the species. Gauss found that he was able to allow one the prey species to survive if he provided some sort of refuge for them. In this case it was a sediment on the bottom of the tank that allowed some of the individuals to survive predation. Figure 1420 shows the impact of adding this refuge area and it actually provided a source for the prey population to come back after it had been reduced by the predators. Huffaker's experiments with mites in oranges and creating barriers that accommodated the, the way that the mites managed to move around demonstrated that providing refuge areas for the prey allowed this oscillation pattern to develop uh, in the laboratory environment. Another type of refuge that prey use in order to avoid their predators is to hide in a large group. So the more prey that there are, the fewer percentage-wise are actually consumed. You can think in terms of, of the predator having a certain number that it can actually consume and after that then those prey are going to be left alone because it's not going to chase them down. So when you think of schools of fishes or large large herds of animals that's one of the ways that they protect themselves. Some plants and animals use this strategy by producing huge numbers of seeds or offspring or the larvae turn into adults and very, very large numbers over a small period of time and that way they overwhelm their predators and a higher percentage of the individuals then survives. The cicada is a good example of this. Some of these are in the ground for maybe 50 years and then they all come out in a very short period of time. Two years ago I was in Washington DC and witnessed one of these emergences where the ground was just covered with cicadas. It was almost dangerous and uh, for people driving around it was slippery because there were so many cicadas on the ground and they affected a lot of trees in the area as they laid their eggs in the the ends of branches and those, those uh, small twigs would fall off and then it would start another cycle. Another type of refuge is simply the size of the animal. If the animal is too large for a predator to handle, 
then if we think in terms of optimal foraging theory, it's certainly not going to waste its energy in order to try to handle it and then fail. So some animals will create protection by making themselves look bigger than they actually are. We see this in some types of toads where they stand up on their tiptoes, as it were, and puff up their bodies. And we also saw the example in your book on the F F F the uh, mayfly, Ephenerility, uh, which causes its body to look larger and they face the foraging stoneflies. The reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone has provided opportunities to study the changes in distribution of prey and they call this change in distribution the ecology of fear because the animals avoid areas where the predators are going to be able to get at them more effectively where they're more vulnerable so the riparian habitat that's habitat that's near rivers would provide an area where the wolves could surround and corner the uh, elk up against that river because they wouldn't be able to cross it and then they would be able to pick off the more vulnerable elk in the process. So here we see uh, animals changing their behavior because of fear of a predator. So the key points from this chapter are that there's a tremendous diversity of complex interactions that occur between predators and prey and uh, host and parasite and that animals are constantly exploiting each other in a variety of ways. Some of this has been predicted using mathematical models and can be used by resource managers in order to determine the effect of the introduction of certain animals like we talked about in Yellowstone um, Park. Well, we also looked at the various types of refuges, that is places where animals can avoid predation and ways that animals can avoid, avoid predation by hiding in a certain type of habitat that their predator can't reach or by reaching a size that predators can't handle or pretending to be a size that predators can't handle and then also changing their behavior so that they actually avoid the predators in areas where they're more vulnerable.